Good. Uh, thank you, Ibrik. Uh, good evening, everyone, and from uh, rainy Yorkshire. Today's topic is airway management. Um, now, the slides today are not the same slides as you've got because in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, there have been developments. One is a paper that Emmanuel sent uh, through the chat line and the other is uh, the importance of tracheostomy. So I've really tried to beef up this lecture and I hope that it won't be too facile because I'm sure airway management in trauma and in uh, paramedic practice is something that you guys are very good at. So in the title, I've, I've just put in red, in critically ill patients in the re low resource countries is where we're heading for. Um, so go back 30 years. Uh, this is uh, the top left picture is a, a, my equipment in uh, northern Belize in Central America. Uh, you can see that uh, starting from left to right, a Coke tin uh, uh, as my shop's disposal. You've got your tri-service apparatus uh, with an oxygen inlet pipe. Uh, you've got endotracheal tubes. Uh, you've got a two laryngoscopes, one plastic, one metal, various drugs of which uh, I will mention ephedrine as my chronotrope and inotrope. Uh, and you've got the airway adjuncts and the, the uh, clever of you will notice there's no LMA because at this stage, LMA was uh, not in uh, uh, clinical practice. The middle picture shows you the team that will intubate a critically injured patient in Combustion in uh, Afghanistan. And you can see for the airway, you've got uh, uh, anesthesiologist number one with a operating theater technician on his right and then me as the extra uh, uh, anesthetist in case uh, things are difficult. The two uh, uh, nurses uh, doing a, uh, a sideshow. One will cut the garments off and the other one will get IV access and give the antibiotics and tetanus. Uh, the people behind uh, are, are the, uh, the, the sort of the workers, the, the shifting, the uh, uh, of, of the patient that is due soon, the radiographer and the extra equipments on your left. And what you can't see just behind the person on the bottom left is the documentation person. He uh, makes all the, uh, um, makes a note of all the vital signs and all the interventions that are being done. So that's Cam Bastin. And then at the bottom right, uh, uh, what it's like in theatre. Uh, you can, you have loads of people uh, dealing with just one patient who is critically ill. So that's the background uh, that we're, uh, I'm talking about that uh, I've been uh, growing up in. So in 30 years, I've moved from the basic tri-service apparatus on your left, uh, going down to sophisticated state-of-the-art equipment on the right. Now, just to put things into perspective, in 1991 was the first Gulf War. And I was co-located with the U.S. Air Force in Tabuk in Saudi Arabia. They arrived and they had prefabricated operating theaters, uh, ICUs, et cetera, et cetera. Two days before the war started, there was a massive sandstorm and the whole hospital complex was unusable. So the only way we could provide anesthesia in Tabuk was with the equipment that was could, can, uh, that is carried in a Lacon box the size of a small suitcase. So when you're talking about a, le a low resource environment, there are some advantages of it, of, of it being small and cheap and and uh, portable. Now, uh, can any uh, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we can hear. Okay. Uh, so let's 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 look at what let's look at the bigger picture. So here is anesthesia. Anesthesia consists of a triad: hypnosis, sleep, analgesia, and muscle relaxation. But you must also consider 
autonomic homeostasis. Autonomic homeostasis is keeping the vital signs for that patient and for his comorbidity and the drugs he's on within the normal limits. So the triad of anesthesia needs to be bumped up by the addition of keeping the vital signs and, and especially things like temperature, which are often forgotten. Now, today we're talking about airway management. So you've got to put somebody to sleep. Clearly, you can put them to sleep by an IM injection of ketamine or uh, gas them down or give them an intravenous induction. But in an emergency and in a critically ill patient, you haven't got the time for this because these are dangerous. You go for a rapid sequence induction. And that's what we're talking about. But once you've put them to sleep, then you've got to be able to maintain it. And you can either maintain it with uh, inter, uh, with uh, inhalational or intravenous uh, technique. So this is why I'm saying I'm just talking of the start of the process for a somebody who is critically ill. Now, for most of you, you'll be putting the patient to sleep, uh, maintain them, and then send them to a level of care that's superior. So emergence or extubation or weaning the patient is not something that the great majority of you will do. Most of your cases will be emergency. They won't be elective by definition. And your choice of, um, of, um, of uh, uh, your technique will depend on you, the surgery, uh, the, if there is going to be surgery, the kind of patient you've got, and also the logistics. So just to, uh, to reassure Michael, all these slides will be sent out again uh, because some of them are new additions. So let's look at rapid sequence induction. What is it? We want to convert an awake patient who can protect the airway, render them unconscious, get a secured airway. A secured airway is not just a patent airway, but it prevents gastric aspiration. That's the difference. So when I talk about a secured airway, I'm talking about a prevention of gastric aspiration. An LMA is a patent airway, but not a secure airway. So in clinical practice, the, the usual choice is between propofol or ketamine or thiopentin, because we still have uh, some people who prefer thiopentin, for example, in, in obstetric cases. And then your muscle relaxant, either succinamethonium or rocuronium. So you prepare your uh, anesthetic room, get your machine checked, check you've got your emergency equipment and drugs, choose your drugs, make sure you've got your, your own personal bias of what drugs else you might. Uh, uh, for example, in my practice, fentanyl was a pretreatment, dexamethasone, especially if there was a bony involvement like dental work, or orthopedic work, and surgeons usually like antibiotics being given prior to the surgery. But for emergency drugs, here there are, uh, these were my uh, uh, favorites, atropine uh, for chronotropy, ephedrine for inotropy and chronotropy, and metaraminol, because that was just my choice. So small doses of metaraminol if uh, things go haywire and I need to get the blood pressure up. And I also would insist on having an extra syringe of succimethonium, because once you put a patient to sleep, and something happens to your syringe, which has happened to me a few times in my career. Somebody just knocked off the syringe or uh, somebody's misplaced it. Uh, it's always useful to have an extra uh, syringe. You then prepare your patient uh, in an emergency. You wouldn't be going through the WHO checklist, uh, but you must also make sure that all your equipment is right. And it is thought in clinical practice, good clinical practice, minimum of three people. Now, you are probably not going to have three people. You're more likely to have two. And that second person might be somebody you have to train on the hoof. Then you've got your RSI process, and also you need to consider the complications. So that's the, the, the process. Now, the nine Ps of a rapid sequence induction, uh, 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 there, are seven, uh, there are lots of variations, but I, li I, I like this one because you, you plan, you prepare, you protect the C-spine if it is indicated by the history uh, of the uh, situation, positioning the patient to optimize uh, uh, intubation, pre-oxygenation, which is basically denitrogenation 
of the lungs. Triglyceride pressure, which according to the low resource uh, manual is no longer used, but uh, most uh, anesthesiologists still do. Paralysis and induction, which is part of the RSI. Confirmation with capnography, and then what you do once you've intubated the patient, a checklist. So why would you do RSI? Well, in a critically ill patient, it's because you need uh, someone to be rapidly unconscious if they are not already unconscious. Rapid intubating circumstances. You want a secure highway. You want to reduce the risk of regurgitation, which is passive, as opposed to vomiting, which is active. So if you mess around with the dose of the induction agent, you can get a patient who can still vomit. But if they have an adequate dose of induction agent, they can only regurgitation. So placement uh, and, and uh, positioning the patient at 45 degrees will reduce regurgitation. Um, and, and this is important. And obviously, in every emergency setting, this is critical. Where it is contraindicated is that if you know that airway is going to be difficult, either it may be a massive trauma, it could be a major burn, or a known history of, of difficult, intu uh, uh, difficult uh, intubation in the past, if the face mask is uh, difficult to, to, to do, if the front of the neck access is not possible, so it, it, there may be a constriction from a, a, a long-standing problem, uh, like an old burn, or it could be from trauma, if you don't have the expertise or you don't have the ex uh, assistance, the lack of equipment and obviously a, uh, a hostile environment, which is what you have to consider when you talk about uh, doing an RSI. Soap me is a mnemonic, which we'll consider uh, in, uh, later, but monitoring, the best monitor is an experienced observer. I repeat that, the best monitor is the uh, trained and experienced observer. And whatever your choice is, uh, most of this is familiar, but temperature will drop as soon as you anesthetize a patient. As soon as you induce anesthesia, the patient moves from a homeothermic to a poikilothermic. Poikilo is fish, fish-like. They take the temperature of the surroundings. This is why when you're doing obstetrics, or you're doing burns, we, we operate in a high temperature environment, so there's no heat loss during anesthesia. And one of the most important things in terms of uh, confirming uh, the intubation is, uh, is uh, capnography. And you know that you might have some uh, vacillations from the cardiac oscillations. And once you intubate, you get your square sine wave. If there is a abnormality of uh, uh, um, a placement, you might get a, a change in a shape. If it's more like a fin-like, it's more like to be uh, bronchospastic. That is roughly what you want, but that's what you get. The patient might have arrested or you, know, you might have got, uh, become disconnected. Now, I'm not going to insult you guys about what you do uh, in terms of airway management. So I'm, I'm not going to spend any time on these. This is just for completion. So your manual airway, uh, be careful how you do it. Jaw thrust is very painful, good for uh, C-spine problems. Airway adjuncts, uh, th th this is familiar, the sizing, et cetera, et cetera, how to insert an nasal airway. The only thing I will make about this, uh, uh, this slide is that I always judge somebody's clinical practice by the minimum amount of airway adjuncts. So I don't want to see bilateral nasal airways and an oral airway uh, because that to me, each time you instrument the airway, you're increasing the, uh, the risk. And the other reason why I like the oral pharyngeal airway after intubation is that the bite block uh, pre prevents the patient if they become awake and they bite on the tube, they'll bite on the bite block. And the second reason why I like the oral pharyngeal airway is that it, uh, it prevents the uh, ET tube from moving from side to side. In terms of how you deliver your oxygen, uh, know, uh, my, my advice to you is know your equipment. I don't know what equipment you have, neither do I know the performances of your equipment. 
So if you're using a bit of equipment, read the literature, read the literature that comes with it, know what the flow rates are, and know what the predicted FiO2 is going to be. I'm only going to make a point about the high flow nasal cannula, because if you've got a difficult intubation, remember, oxygenation is passive. Carbon dioxide el elimination is active. So if I paralyze you and, pr uh, give you, uh, and provide you a nasal cannula, your pulse oximeter will read 100% until the hypercarbia kills you. So, so the pulse oximetry is not a good indicator of ventilation. But having a high flow cannula at the time of a rapid sequence induction means the moment you take the mask off, you've still got that diffuse oxygenation process going. And this may be critical in somebody who's obese or somebody who's pregnant or somebody who, who's, uh, whose airway is uh, going to be difficult. Nowadays, with COVID, we've got to make sure that we use filters. And the moment you start using filters, you increase the, the, the complexity of equipment. And this is more likely to dislodge. This is more likely to get obstructed. So the more you do uh, and you bustleize your equipment to suit the situation, you run the risk of, of uh, making things difficult. Now, here is a picture I took from the internet. Uh, please note the position of the fingers. The, the, the thumb and the, uh, and, and the index finger is to maintain a seal. The middle finger is to lift the momentum up. And the uh, little finger is to try and give you a little bit of jaw thrust. But I always uh, teach my students, use the fourth finger to palpate the radial pulse. You can feel the radial pulse at the notch, just uh, uh, anterior to the angle of the jaw. So just by placement of your fingers on a, uh, on a, on a face uh, uh, mask, uh, you have got ABC control. And D, because you can see, look at the pupils. Now, I judge an experienced operator by the way they hold the uh, uh, back valve mask. If I see somebody holding the back valve mask like this, I know they're not experienced. Because I would challenge any one of you, any one of you, to ventilate, manually ventilate somebody like this for more than half an hour. The best position for uh, the inflating bag is to have it on your forearm and use your thumb to ventilate the bag. The thumb doesn't tire as easily as the other fingers. So treat your bag with great amount of respect. And by holding it under, uh, supported by your forearm, you will not tire and your shoulders won't tire. The longest I've done a manual ventilation is three hours uh, because a young child aspirated with multiple congenital defects and there was no specialist equipment for intubation till the retrieval team came in. So that's my, my uh, practical lesson to you. The LMA has been amazing. Um, Archie Brain, the inventor, came to the military hospital in, in the uh, mid-1980s and showed us the, uh, the uh, original uh, pr uh, 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 prototype. And I remember saying to Dr. Brain, I don't think this will catch. And I actually published in 1990 uh, the benefits of an LMA for difficult intubation. And this was finally published in the C Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, highly quoted in the early years. This is now 30 years ago. But it was dismissed from the American journals and the British journals as unsafe. Can you imagine? This was unsafe. And remember that an LMA or uh, whatever supraglottic device you have will not work for an infraglottic swelling such as in an airway burns. And there have been many modifications of, of the, uh, the eye gel and also the intubating uh, uh, LMA. But if you're going to intubate somebody using an ordinary LMA, make sure you don't have any of the fenestrations uh, that are uh, attached to it. The endotracheal tube, uh, you are, 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 I mean, I'm sure well aware of it, the way you tie it, the way you secure it. Um, there are commercial or ordinary ties. 
my standard choice of uh, tube is an armor tube because you can bend it, shape it. It doesn't make any difference. And just remember, the cuff pressures must be within the 20 to 30 centimeters of water. But if your cuff pressure increases the capillary pressure of the trachea, which is about 32 millimeters of mercury, you're going to develop a scarring and give the patient tracheal stenosis. Now, this is not a problem with the high volume, low pressure endotracheal tubes today. But certainly when I was studying anesthesia in the mid 1980s, red rubber tubes were in, 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 in uh, use and prolonged intubation that these patients got tracheal stenosis. And uh, a young soldier transferred from Germany to the UK for tracheal resection surgery uh, died because when he, he aspirated whilst having dinner the day before surgery, nobody told the, uh, the crash team that he had a stenosis and we couldn't have uh, we couldn't intubate him and he would he could have benefited from a cricothyroidotomy so a tracheostomy and the tube this is the military version because it's uh, it's purple that's how you know it's a military version this is the godsend it has really transformed clinical practice and we'll see later your your placement for cricothyroidotomy is through the uh, cricothyroid membrane but if you're going for percutaneous, you either go through the first and second or second and third. And a, tra a standard tracheostomy is a second and third procedure, and it is done by a surgeon, and it is not a quick procedure. So how do you define uh, what might be difficult? Well, here are some features. that The length of incisive, they're long. Uh, they, 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 where, whether you've got a, a, a small uh, mandible, uh, whether you cannot move your mandibles to the front of your maxilla. If the distance between your, your mouth opening is less than three centimeters, if you can't see the uvula, as in Malampati's classification, the shape of the palate, is it high arch or narrow, like the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, patients with Marfan syndrome, you know, the baseball, uh, ba uh, basketball players, tall with long uh, uh, with high arch palace they'll be a difficult uh, um, uh, intubation compliance of mandibular space if you if if it's rotten with infected or or or, um, or uh, full of pus that's going to make it difficult if the thyro mental thyro mental distance is less than three finger breaths then that's going to be difficult if the short stubby neck uh, either because they're obese or because they've got a restricted uh, movement or they're pregnant and edematous. Thickness of the neck, anything beyond 43 centimeters is going to be a difficult intubation. And if they can't move their head and neck for whatever reason, uh, I'm thinking of things like ankylosing spondylitis, uh, that, that's going to be a, a, a challenge. And if you've got a worry about C-spine, my preferred choice is having uh, a, an, an operator hold on to um, uh, the spine manually because it can actually, with, with the devices in place, uh, it can be really very difficult. So Malampati is a India, uh, Indian uh, anesthesiologist based in Canada, and he has transformed clinical practice because his uh, views on looking at a patient's or a pharynx as you're sitting in front of them is linked to the McCormack and Lehane's views at laryngoscopy. So if you can see everything, then you're more likely to, uh, to get a good view. And if you can't see the uh, uvula uh, or anything of the retropharynx, you're more likely to get a, a difficult intubation. And identifying the cardiothoracic, uh, the, uh, the cricothyroid membrane, then we we talk about the the handshake, and you, I've given you the uh, uh, the uh, reference, so you can have a look at it. What has changed is the use of cricoid pressure. Brian Selick, uh, who was a London anesthesiologist, described it, uh, and it became almost mandatory in emergencies to apply cricoid pressure. This was basically uh, Selick's maneuver or cricoid pressure, and the pressure that you you have to do to do it properly is actually quite a lot. It's the equivalent of three kilograms. So the next time you're near a weighing machine, 
press your fingers down on a weighing machine and apply three kilos. It has to be uncomfortable. And you apply it just as the uh, induction agent goes. And the teaching was at that stage, you only took cricoid pressure if once the, the tube was in the right place, the, the cuff inflated and uh, a confirmation of the, the uh, position of the uh, uh, tube was confirmed. But that has changed uh, uh, considerably over the years, and we will talk about uh, the burp maneuver in a, in, in a case. Now, I talked about the increased risk of regurgitation in emergency and the increase of aspiration. Regurgitation is is uh, passive. Okay, it's it, uh, it can be uh, reduced by gravity. So if you're obese or you've got uh, reflux or you've got a full stomach, usually uh, not only of food, but also it could be of carbonated drinks, uh, including alcohol. And those are the kind of uh, worries, the high concern or, or, or the late pregnancy, or the full stomach, inadequate fasting, or delayed gastric emptying to disease, or because they've been delayed. Uh, gastric emptying is, is, uh, would be delayed in something like a, like a diabetic. And then stress, uh, uh, pain, uh, bowel obstruction, all these kind of things will, com will compound it. To reduce the risk of aspiration, you position them. Uh, lithotomy is, is uh, not a good idea because obviously uh, it changes the dynamics uh, for a, br a brain perfusion. But for me, I prefer a, a sitting up position, or oh, 45 degrees uh, sitting up position and remember that if they've got an impaired laryngeal reflex, uh, either due to a, a level of consciousness that's reduced or it's a neuromuscular problem, uh, then uh, you have to take care. So the only maneuver is Takahata's burp maneuver, which is backward, upward, rightward pressure. And this brings the view of the, uh, of the tracheal inlet into line, because as you know, the laryngoscope is on the left, by doing a backward, upward, right pressure, you bring the uh, uh, the uh, 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 the tracheal inlet into view. Most anesthetists, uh, you will see, uh, do that by just manipulating the thyroid cartilage. But burp is uh, is now uh, regarded as the only maneuver that should be used in uh, airway management. And if you've got somebody in in who is really obese, think of ramping. Think of head elevation and make sure that the ear to the sternal notch is in a straight line because this allows you to get the oral, uh, 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 pharyngeal and tracheal inlets into as straight a line as possible. So that's uh, uh, this ramping for obese patients or even those who are pregnant and eclamptic where they're already swollen, large breasts, uh, positioning is critical. Pre-treatment, I've put it there just because you guys are master's students, so you need to know uh, the pros and cons. The, uh, uh, the literature in terms of uh, uh, low-resource countries is against it, as you know from, from reading your textbook. Uh, but uh, when, you, when you manipulate uh, or instrument the, the oropharynx, you get a sympathetic discharge. You elevate the ICP. You can get a bronchospasm. You can get a bradycardia in children who are vaguely tonic. And you can get a lot of arrhythmias, uh, both brady and tachyarrhythmias, which I'll discuss in a second. My favorite choice was fentanyl and lidocaine. Um, uh, it shows my age because lidocaine was very trendy in the 1990s, uh, especially in head injuries. But the current evidence is against it. Uh, fentanyl is a quick-acting opioid. Uh, it reduces the amount of, uh, of uh, induction agent uh, you've got. It's also kinder for the patient. It also obtains the, the trauma of instrumentation and tracheal intubation. Uh, the, the, the difficulty here is that patients, uh, the, uh, the, the operator doesn't give enough time for it to work. So you have to remember, is this a crash induction? In other words, uh, uh, is it going to be done now or have you got control conditions uh, for it to be used? I can't tell you the importance of pre-oxygenation. Pre-oxygenation is basically a denitrogenation of the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, nitrogen within the lungs, uh, and that buys you time. And you can make your uh, make it easier for yourself by putting also at the same time 10 liters by a nasal uh, nasal cannula, so that even when they have stopped breathing and you've taken the mask off, they're still going to get oxygen diffusion because that's a uh, passive process. So pre-oxygenation is important. Three big breaths if you are uh, eight, uh, eight sorry eight deep breaths if you, if you are in a hurry. But normally three to five minutes of slow breathing from a tight uh, non-rebreather is useful. Now, whatever your uh, uh, RSI process, I'm not going to ask you to change your practice because you need to be comfortable with what you do. But the timeline is important. By the time you intubate somebody, uh, you need to make sure that you get your tube in quickly. It's quite a um, uh, 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 people resource uh, uh, busy in, in clinical practice, and you've got to have your, your uh, uh, sequence uh, already planned and practiced before you start. This is not the time to have new members in the team. So going to the checklist, prepare and equip the team, perform uh, uh, the the uh, induction, direct laryngoscopy, preferably with, with video cameras so that other people can see what you're doing. So this is why video cameras have become uh, important. And then if you can get an EG tube, that's great. If you can't, then you've got to go back to Balmot mask or the LMA, whichever type you've got. Uh, and then if that fails, go for your cricothyroidotomy. So this, these equipment is what we would uh, normally do in the operating theater. But remember, this lecture is actually not to, nothing to do with the operating theater. We need to transfer it to somebody who's critically ill, where the resources uh, and, uh, and, uh, and expertise is often limited. So how do you know that the tube is in the right place? So the person intubating the patient must see the tube go down the cords. That's the, the only thing that is 100% guaranteed. Symmetrical chest movements on uh, IPPV, condensation in the EG tube, sustain CO2 for more than six consecutive breaths by capnography. Why six? If a patient has had a carbonated beer or soft drink, or they've been given an antacid as we do give our, our, our obstetric caesarean sections, you're going to have CO2 within the, uh, the stomach. So when you actually ventilating them, you can get a false CO2 from the aerated carbon dioxide within the gastric mucosa. That is why I look for six consecutive waveforms to make sure I've got that square waveform rather than uh, the other one where it just deteriorates like you would in a ROSC. Uh, sorry, in a, in a cardiac arrest. And then you must auscultate in the axilla because if the tube slips down the right main bronchus, it will block off uh, the right upper main bronchus. And that is the reason for having the Murphy's eye uh, in the uh, AT tube so that if it is accidentally slipped down the right main bronchus, you will still aerate the right upper lobe. ET depth, uh, uh, lower in females, will avoid an endobronchial um, intubation. Uh, ideally, you want the, uh, the cuff two to three centimeters above the carina. Uh, Doppler sign over the superstone lodge may confirm it if you've got the equipment. Uh, and in intensive care, we just put a, a confirmatory bronchoscopy to make sure the tube's in the right place. In ITU, you've got a challenge. You might have to change the ET tube. Uh, and, and this is not as easy as it sounds. If the intubation is, is straightforward, it could be a simple swap. Uh, the other way is to preload a fiber optic uh, uh, bronchoscope, go past the cords, uh, 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 and then take the original, uh, de deflate the original uh, 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 endotracheal tube and then slide the, uh, the new tube from the fiber, uh, fiber optic bronchoscope. You can use long stilettes or bougie, but the, you really need to make sure they're long. And I preload my, my, uh, my bougies because it just makes it quicker. Or you might convert an endotracheal tube to a tracheostomy. I've done this on several times for major burns where the patients were intubated. You're now going to ventilate these patients for a long time. 
And so basically the tracheostomy can take anything to about 40 minutes, 50 minutes if there's a lot of swelling. So as soon as the, the surgeon has cut through the second and third uh, tracheal rings, uh, he, then he then makes an incision in the cartilage. That's usually uh, when he deflates my cuff. Uh, uh, not deliberately, but that's just where the cuff is. I then withdraw the endotracheal tube so that he can put the tracheostomy tube. And if for some reason he can't do it, I just shove my tube back in um, uh, a couple of centimeters and ventilate and have another go. So those are the, the exchange of ETs. Now, the, the number of complications that occur during uh, airway, uh, invasive airway management is huge. Uh, and, and, and these are just some of, of the uh, uh, complications uh, that, that can occur. What is ironic, the most uh, biggest complaint is uh, dental damage. So uh, just remember that in clinical practice, dental damage is one that causes the patient most, uh, most concern. But what is interesting is the cardiovascular system is uh, the most uh, perturbed and the mo most difficult. And I'm very uh, grateful to Emmanuel, uh, who's, a, uh, who's a member of the team, who sent me this uh, article uh, that is on the chat line. Uh, by, uh, it's an editorial by Rusoto on an article. They looked at two, 2,964 adults, uh, endotracheal intubation, and 1979 sites in 29 countries um, intubating somebody uh, in critical care. And cardiovascular instability occurred 42.6%. And what was really interesting, the reasons for intubation are not the reasons you and I normally meet, but they're for respiratory problems. And Michael Tuconi asked me some time ago, when you intubate somebody, how the hell do you, do you, do you, do you cope? with the changes in the, in the cardiac and the respiratory dynamics uh, of positive uh, pressure ventilation. And I said to Mike, I'm sorry, Mike, I can't give you an answer because I don't know what the individual case is. <coughs> now, as I showed to you before, in my first slide of my setup in, in uh, Belize, I would normally have a 500 mil bag of uh, Hartman's or Ringer lactate. If I thought the patient was uh, fluid depleted, I'll just run it in as I'm pre-oxygenating the patient and I would have some noradrenaline, no, sorry, norepinephrine drawn up so I can give some boluses uh, and also my ephedrine, which I referred to, so which is a chronotrope, inotrope, uh, and it's the only one that is safe for obstetric cases. That's, that's the logic for my choice because if you use any of uh, the other vasoactive substances in, case in critical care in obstetrics, uh, you will reduce placental blood flow and you kill the, uh, the fetus. And what this uh, paper has done is to sort of say, can you assess the fluid status? That is very, very difficult. Ultrasound will certainly give you more information. Do you need to start your vasopressure or increase the vasopressure if it's running in prior to induction going? The recommendation is stabilize it with nor, uh, norepinephrine to keep the MAP above 75 or the MAP 20 millimeters above baseline. And they consider boluses of calcium or phenylephrine or vasopressin, ephedrine and epinephrine. So remember, I said to you, my go-to drugs in critical care, uh, patient who's ill and who is likely to die, my drugs of choice are norepinephrine infusion and ephedrine. But what is different and what I would change in this practice is to reduce my boluses of fluid from 500 mils to 250 mil boluses because it is easier to give another bolus, but it's harder to take the fluid out if you've messed it out. And if you are in a high resource, high intense uh, situation, then mechanical cardiac support or emergency extracorporeal life support is what's recommended. So my, my take home point is keep it simple, choose your vasopressor of choice. So mine is norepinephrine and ephedrine and small boluses of lactate. Now, you may be surprised uh, that the choice of induction agent, I, 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 you, you choose whatever you, you want. Uh, suffice to say, midazolam and opioids are, are, are not induction agents. Ketamine is uh, uh, used frequently, 
And if you uh, talk to somebody, why do you use uh, ketamine? Oh, because it's a bronchodilated uh, cardiovascular stimulant, my dance, uh, brain producer, whatever. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that even with ketamine, used as my induction agents in the critical, I've had drops in blood pressure. Uh, Etomidate, because of the uh, cortisol inhibition, adrenal suppression is gone. Propofol uh, in lower doses uh, can still work. It's, uh, and thiopent, you'll see some old uh, anesthesiologists still doing thiopentone. My ex boss uh, uh, would use thiopentone for every, every occasion. And her patients did just as well as anybody else. So the take home message is. Just because you're using ketamine doesn't mean that you're not going to get hypotensive uh, fluxes in uh, during your intubation. And if you've got a difficult uh, uh, airway, uh, laryngoscopy, if you succeed, fantastic, proceed to tracheal intubation. If you fail to intubate, put a supraglottic airway in, uh, in the UK, that would be an LMA, uh, and think about what you need to do. Unfortunately, in, in our critically ill patient, this is may not something we can wake the patient up because this is an operative, elective operative uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, can you um, uh, face mask them? Uh, and if not, proceed to cricothyroidotomy. Now, if you uh, get to psycho, which is can't intubate, can't oxygenate, then front of neck access is critical. Now, I am uh, I was for uh, eight years the, the uh, military leader for battles, which is the British uh, uh, military's uh, emergency advanced trauma life support on the battlefield. And our teaching was that you did horizontal uh, incisions for the, the, the crike. The Americans prefer a vertical one. And I will give you my reasons why I prefer a, um, a horizontal one in a few minutes. But it doesn't really matter uh, if the patient's obtundent, you don't have to use local anesthetic. If you're going to use local anesthetic, make sure that you don't put it over the incision, but you put it on parallel to where you're going to. And th uh, that area of skin is anesthetized, and that's when you can put your uh, uh, thick sutures to tie in your tracheostomy tube. When you make your incision, make sure that your non-dominant hand keeps the skin taut. Because if the patient's hypercarbic, hypoxic, it will bleed. By stretching it, you will minimize the, the blood loss. When you're making your incision, you go one way and then go turn around without coming out and go the other way. If you make too small an incision, you're going to increase the displacement of the tube between the skin and other facial muscle layers. So the importance of a big uh, incision is important. You can use a bougie to try and imp, uh, instrument the airway, but as a general rule, a minimum amount of instrumentation, the better is it for the patient. Now, at the other end of the, the spectrum, uh, again, this is something that uh, very few of you would do, but it, I've, I've got the latest guidelines, how to extubate somebody in a basic environment, how do you do it in a low-risk uh, critical care environment, and how you do it in an at-risk algorithm. Intubation and extubation is just like flying an aircraft. Those are the most, to uh, most dangerous times uh, 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 of the whole process of anesthesia, uh, and um, the, the, uh, the only way you're going to learn how to do it is to see an expert do it and be supervised to do it. And remember, if somebody's got a difficult airway, then they, they, the patient must be told and they carry a card so that future people will know uh, what to do. So if you want any further information, these are the two uh, uh, guidelines, uh, one, one uh, from the Difficult Airway Society and the other one, more recent one, uh, with the result of, uh, of COVID. Now... I, I put this in because the last time uh, I did any critical, critically ill intubation was last year in the uh, COVID intensive care unit. Uh, the, uh, the intubation was incredibly difficult thing to do. I, I can't tell you how stressful it was. This, I'm talking as an, an experienced anesthetist, having another an experienced uh, anesthetist with all the equipment and all uh, the, the drugs ready. It is stressful because you are in PPE, 
your your views are limited uh, the the uh, the timing is critical the crashing uh, of of the cardiovascular system is amazing uh, so you've got to have everything ready and there is n nothing more enjoyable professionally than to see a slick intubation or a change of a tube or conversion to a tracheostomy in critical care because what really matters is what happens to the vital signs during that process so for me a hallmark of a good clinician is how little perturbation they get. It doesn't matter what they use, what drugs they use, or what combination. You've got to be happy with what you do and what you've got. That's the, the challenge uh, that we have. But preparation, preparation, planning, planning, you're going to get a good performance. So I've, I've put this in so that you can actually check the implications of the uh, airway. Uh, in covoid. If you've got somebody who's bearded, don't shave the beard off because, in, in, for example, in Muslim countries, that is not uh, a, a, a socially acceptable thing. But if you can apply some paraffin gauze on the beard, you're going to get a better seal. If your needle drops out soon after induction, which has happened to me on at least three occasions, you can take a 25 gauge needle and inject the succimathonium into the tongue. And then Put another cannula in. Think about a retrograde technique, uh, uh, putting a wire from a, a cannulation set, fetching it out, and then railroading the tube down. So in my pack, I always had an epidural and a long wire from a central cannulation kit so that if I needed it, uh, I would have it without having to uh, rush for it. You can intubate through an LMA, provided the fenestrations that prevent the epiglossus from fluffing back. And remember, do not cut a ET tube in an upper airway burn because the swelling will make the change or the connector very difficult. And, and finally, the, the other is the more horrible the fra facial fractures, the easier it is. The most difficult intubations are when it's one-sided and that side is going to spasm and mouth opening can be limited. And uh, can I just to make a, uh, another point about succimethonium? Uh, people, um, if you remember, succimethonium is kept in the fridge, and if it's kept out of the fridge for a long time, and in hot climates, it will lose its efficacy. The second is, don't rush once you give a succimethonium, because you know you get the fasciculations. And once the feet stop fasciculating, then ideally it's ready for intubation. So just remember that, that clinical pearl. Now, um, I worked till last year at Manchester University Hospital, and one of my uh, colleagues uh, has, has made a name for himself of being the tracheostomy, leading tracheostomy expert in the world by doing a lot of work on tracheostomy care. You do a tracheostomy because it helps in the weaning or because you've got an upper way obstruction, either anticipated, like in a major uh, new burn or actual obstruction. It allows for suctioning, it protects from aspiration. It gives you patency either in trauma or uh, for emergency or elective surgery, or you're going to have long-term invasive ventilation for medical cases like bulbar palsy or chronic lung conditions. The advantage is that you bypass uh, the upper airway, so you've got lowered airway resistance, less work of breathing, and uh, uh, makes weaning easier. It's a uh, decreased need for sedation, better for the patient. It allows you to clean the oral cavity, which is a source of infection. It's also a horrible uh, feeling for patients when they don't have their oral hygiene. It allows easier communication, uh, allows you to mobilize the patient. I go back to the Bali bombings in uh, uh, where Professor um, uh, in charge uh, in, um, 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 started sitting all the patients up so that when the swelling on the face and neck came, it reduced the felling of the head and neck. So try and sit these patients up so that uh, the swelling uh, will uh, be less in the head and neck area. It also allows you to, uh, to, for the patient to have oral intake and it reduces uh, erosion from prolonged endotracheal intubation, but it doesn't reduce the erosion from a prolonged tra uh, tracheostomy intubation. So anatomy, it's 10 centimeters long, runs from C6 to T4, 15 to 20 U-shaped cartilage. Remember the cricoid is the only one that's a full ring. 
It's lined by ciliated epithelium, the staircase of uh, which wafts off the sputum, uh, and that is what is uh, is uh, is damaged when you give uh, dry gases from medical cylinders. And one of the reasons why I don't like a vertical incision uh, in my cricothyroidotomy, as practiced by the Americans, you've got a high risk of cutting the isthmus or jugular venous arch. Sites for tracheostomy, the many via the CTM, percutaneous uh, between rings one and two or two and three using a Siaglia technique, which is basically putting a wire uh, through a needle and then dilating it with different, um, uh, different uh, diameters, or tracheostomy, which takes a long time and it rings two and three. On x-ray, uh, chest x-ray, the cuff should be, the, sorry, the end of the tube should be at least two to three centimeters above carina. So as the patient's neck is flexed or extended, uh, it doesn't uh, disappear down the right main bronchus, or if it's too high, it doesn't fall out of the trachea. So what happens if you uh, do a tracheopsy? Well, you reduce the anatomical dead space by about 30 to 50%. So your work of breathing is better and you increase your alveolar ventilation, which is your tidal volume minus the dead space. So you're cutting off the dead space. So for each breath, you're getting more uh, alveolar ventilation and therefore more carbon dioxide elimination. It will reduce the airway resistance because it's a shorter tube, but remember the gases will steam in more uh, warming, humidification and filtering. And remember, the internal diameter and external diameter of tubes vary from uh, manufacturer. So you can have two tubes of the same internal diameter, but their external diameter may vary. So when you're doing your tube changes, just make sure you've checked that. Complications, immediate is hemorrhage, uh, misplacement, because you've not made a big hole and the tube has sli uh, slided through. Uh, uh, through uh, the uh, different anatomical layers. Pneumothorax, if you pump to the lung, tube occlusion can occur at any time, especially uh, with a blood clot or a sputum plug and subcutaneous tissue when you've, 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 you've got a misplacement. Delayed, you can include, infect, ulcerate, uh, difficult in obese or stiff necks. You can even get a tracheoesophageal fistula. So a connection within the trachea and the esophagus which means that that patient is going to be condemned to major surgery, thus dis de delaying rehabilitation and recovery. And uh, I've, I've seen at least four cases of tracheal erosions into major vessels, and I can tell you it is the most horrific way to die because the chances of saving somebody like that is almost impossible. The late changes are things like tracheal stenosis, tracheal dilatation, especially if they've got tracheal malacia. Uh, you can get uh, scarring. Uh, or uh, uh, granulomata because of all overgrowing of uh, the the, uh, the scar, or you can have a persistent sinus, or you may need a scar revision. So, a cricothyroidotomy done in pre-hospital care can make a huge difference. This is why I enjoy uh, teaching you guys because you dictate the future of your patients. Several types of tracheostomy tubes. So when you're transferring a patient with a tracheostomy tube, for God's sake, check. Most of them are cuffed and with a pressure less than 25 millimeters of mercury, or you can put water or saline if they're going to be taken up in an aircraft. You can have tracheostomy tubes with inner cannula. So you take the inner cannula for cleaning. So this is mainly in, in long-term uh, tracheostomy tubes. So the tubes can be uncuffed usually because they are primarily used for, uh, f uh, for physiotherapy and bronchial um, uh, suction. Or you can have fenestrated tracheostomy tube, which helps speech, because now air is going through the fenestrations, uh, through the vo vocal cords and allowing speech. And it also means that you wean from a tracheostomy, uh, via the tracheostomy, to back to a normal uh, 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 or, uh, or, or uh, pharynx. And then you can have uh, tracheostomy tubes that have variable flanges. So this will be ideal in patients who've got short necks or long necks or very obese. So just be careful when you're uh, transferring a patient uh, that you know exactly uh, where, where the tube is, what size it is, and how far the distance the flange is from the end of the, uh, the uh, tracheostomy tube. And then finally, uh, for the long-term patients, you have metal tracheostomy tubes, which are silver-coated. That prevents uh, infection uh, by uh, silver is a very good um, uh, anti-infective element. 
the tubes are uncuffed without a 15 millimeter connector. So if the patient arrests, uh, you, you've got to take the tube out uh, and either put a uh, cuffed in tracheostomy tube or a size six endotracheal tube for resuscitation. Suctioning uh, of, a, of, a, of a tracheostomy tube, just like an endotracheal aseptic technique, the suction catheter should be less than 50% of the diameter of the, trache uh, the tracheostomy tube. The French case is two times uh, the size of the tracheostomy minus two. So if you've got an eight millimeter uh, internal diameter tracheostomy tube, it's two times eight minus two, which is 12 uh, French gauge. Use low vacuum suction, 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury. Oxygenate them uh, uh, bef beforehand. Insert the catheter 10 to 15 uh, centimeters in the tube before a slow withdrawal but keep your uh, suctioning to a minimum, unless of course it's a, a closed circuit. So uh, weaning may not be something that you do. Uh, I know that Dr. Sanger talked about weaning uh, from a tracheostomy tube or, uh, tr uh, or uh, endotracheal tube. You can only wean if the condition is resolved, lung function is stable, the FI2 is less than 0.4, you're able to swallow a good cough and gag reflex and the patient's comfortable with a cuff deflated. And the way you do it is you deflate the cuff for five to 15 minute periods to start off with, with a 30 minute rest, then extend those periods by a little, um, a, a little more uh, 15 minute aliquots till they can manage a cuff delayed for up to four hours. Then you can either use a, 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 a speaking valve that's one with fenestrations and then cap it off completely. Try and extubate the patient in the morning so you've got all day to uh, look at the patient. And remember, just like an endotracheal tube, you remove it in exhalation. Why? Because if you remove it in exhalation, as you take it to pay, take, tell them to take a deep breath uh, and, uh, and you move the, um, remove the uh, tube, they'll cough or any of the uh, secretions that are still lying above the cuff and then apply occlusive dressing and the, the, uh, the, uh, the scar should heal without stitching. That's my second reason why I like a horizontal cricothyrotomy uh, compared to a vertical uh, thyroidotomy because I think uh, the, the scar, which is horizontal, heals cosmetically much better. I have uh, anesthetized for at least eight or nine cases where, uh, where uh, scars have had to be uh, uh, revised because uh, it was vertical. So the rest of it is, uh, I, I've, I've gone for exactly one hour. I hope, you, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go for the rest of the slides. I will send the, the extra slides in the next 24 hours. I hope I've given you some hope in how you can uh, airway manage a critically ill patient in your, in your uh, low resource country. You choose your drugs. You choose your induction agent, you choose your, your, your equipment, you choose your vasoactive drugs and get to know them well. My, my choice was just ephedrine and, and, um, and uh, uh, norepinephrine, but that's the way I, I, I was taught and it works in my hands. You may find that you've got different uh, methods uh, for different reasons. Um, all I can say is uh, do what uh, uh, works in your hands uh, and uh, I wish you luck. Um, any questions? Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Winston. I got a quick question. Um, you, you just got done mentioning uh, for maintaining their blood pressure through the procedure using uh, ephedrine and uh, norepinephrine. Yeah. Um, I guess, how exactly are you doing that? You're putting it into a, a 10 cc syringe and just giving them small bumps, or I guess, how okay. are you doing that? Um, uh, I have to be really careful uh, answering this question because e everybody works with different doses and, and different preparations. My ephedrine is usually 30 milligrams uh, dissolved in, in 20 mils of uh, saline. So that's my ephedrine, emergency drug. And my norepinephrine, I draw it up as for an infusion. So it's ready to go, rock and roll. Uh, it's attached through a three-way tap. Uh, if I don't uh, feel I have to use it before induction, I don't use it, but I, it's there, it's flushed through, ready to go. Um, one last question. So just looking at the slides, uh, your MAP goals of 75 or greater um, with the push dose. That being said, would you say if the patient's 
uh, map is already less than 75, um, before you're even trying to attempt this, would you use that to bump them up? Yes. To get to that and then induce? Yeah, that, that's that's been defined by uh, by the paper in JAMA this year. Okay. Oh, Michael, uh, I, uh, sorry, uh, just a quick one. I see Michael's face. I need to I apologize, Michael. I forgot to answer your question. Uh, the, when you intubate somebody in a criti who's critically ill, you do two things. You increase the right-sided afterload, and you reduce the left-sided preload. Okay, so when you asked me that question originally, I, I found it very difficult to answer the question because what com what complicates it? Uh, I, don't, I can't give you an answer it's because the majority of cases in, who are critically ill are respiratory cases. So you've got the additional of ARDS, stiff lungs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Third point: if you've got somebody who's septic, the myocardium itself can be uh, can be messed up by by the sepsis process. So um, I'm giving you my excuses for not answering your question. It's perfect. Thank you. I think I think maybe Dennis was saying still saying something. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I also had a question about pre-oxygenation. Yeah. Um, in the field, I just carry an oxygen generator, and that's yeah. probably what I have at, at best. Yeah. Um, and I can get about three liters. Yeah. Um, is there anything I can do to maximize that? Um, the, the, I'm not sure what equipment you're using, but you remember the, the tri-service equipment I showed you? Um, in the Gulf War, uh, we had to use oxygen concentrators, which only gave us 10 liters. So what I would do is I would, I would use the, the uh, bag valve mask to pre-oxygenate a, uh, a patient. And then as soon as the, the, um, the, um, the, the uh, mask was, uh, the mask was taken off the face for the intubation process, my assistant would attach the, the green tubing from the, uh, from the concentrator onto a nasal cannula already pre-placed. Okay, understood. Would you ever consider using PEEP to augment? Uh, I, I'm really uh, scared of PEEP um, because like I, I tried to answer Michael's question. Um, when you're manually ventilating, oh, sorry, if you uh, apply PEEP, um, you don't know what you're doing uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the different populations of alveoli. And what I don't want to do is to blow off the pneumothorax just because, uh, so I'm cautious. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yes, Michael. So I have another question in reference to, uh, again, I understand it's going to be a difficult one to answer as well, but uh, my standard choice of induction agent is ketamine and, uh, you know, a, a neuromuscular blockade, other sucks or rock rhonium. And yep. then once the airway is obtained, uh, it's yep. usually an infusion of midazolam and fentanyl. Yep. I'm wondering uh, for what patient population or what sort of uh, presentation should we consider extending the neuromuscular blockade after the intubation is done? Oh, gosh. No, 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 no. I, I haven't got 50 years to answer that question. <laughs> the, the point I've got to make, Michael, <laughs> is you have got to judge um, yeah, the, the, the difficulty I have uh, giving this lecture, and in fact, every lecture I give you guys, is that I cannot answer everybody's uh, uh, criteria. So let's let, let so so your so let's look at it as a, a a flight. You're taking off from Heathrow Airport, so you've got your 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 in, your induction process already uh, planned. You've also got, to a certain extent, your um, a flight path in terms of uh, fentanyl uh, and um, uh, midazolam infusions going in, okay? Because you can titrate that. Now, neuromuscular brocade, if you're using rock, that's going to last a long time, so you don't have to worry about it till, till, uh, till, till you get a good recovery because you're going to use high dose. Sucks, you've, you've only got a short time, okay? So my question to you is, if, if it is a uh, uh, something... Uh, uh, that is going to 
be just a, a, a sedative anesthesia. In other words, just to keep the patient still because you need to extricate them, transfer them or whatever, then I would continue using boluses. What uh, the, the, the question is, when do you go for emergence? So that's the question you've got to answer. Is this, is this patient somebody I, that's, that has got to go through emergence? In other words, you're assuming that the, the problem for injury in the first place is gone. Now, most of the cases uh, that I assume that you're dealing with, they'll be ill for a long time. So my, my question would be to sort of uh, leave it uh, simple with uh, fentanyl and midazolam. My first, uh, my first question before I intervene is to say, what is happening to the hemo the vital signs? Okay, is is this patient getting tachycardic? Is he getting hypertensive? Is he sweating? Is he uh, has he got tears coming out? So in other words, is this a, a problem of awareness or or fentanyl? Well, then just give them bolus of uh, one or both. Okay. Okay. If there is a a a, a situation that is critical, critical meaning like a severe head injury or somebody that is delicate in terms of say ARDS, where you just can't, you know, you can't afford, uh, afford something, then, that, 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 then that's another indication. But if it's just a, a long bone trauma for our, our argument's sake, well, you don't actually need paralysis because you're ventilating the lungs. You're not ventilating a fractured femur, meaning what, what I'm saying is it depends on whether yeah. it's a head and head and neck or whether it's a body cavity. That's what I'm saying. And then, so, gotcha. so there are patient factors, okay? So the patient, <clears throat> there are your factors. What, what, what have you got? And then the third thing is, have you got the equipment to maintain that flight path till you reach emergence? Now, I, I would suspect in your case, you would probably need top ups of uh, rock. Uh, on, on a regular basis because you're not going to extubate them. Okay. So on top of the fentanyl and midas, just maintaining the paralysis as well. Yeah. That's look, look, at, look, look at the waveforms. Look at the ventilator. Look at the pressures. That should help you get an idea as to what, what's going on. So don't, okay. take, don't take it uh, in isolation. Look at the bigger picture. Because for me, I think it's the reason why I like that fentanyl midase. I love that. That's my favorite combination. It's because you can reverse it if you get into trouble. Yeah. Okay. But you can't reverse a neuromuscular, a uh, deep neuromuscular block, uh, and, and 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 then and then you don't know where you are. So neuromuscular blockade. That is why, if you look at the the uh, the, the textbook, it says neuromuscular blockade shouldn't be used. So I'm teaching you the, the ultimate. But then you, you've got to pick uh, and, and choose depending on, on your experience and what you're allowed to do. But neuromuscular blockade will, uh, is useful for any cavity situation, head and neck, and for what I call where you have to be still, <laughs> you know, a, 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 long, you know, a long flight or a long uh, transfer or, or extrication or whatever. So I can't give you an answer for everything, but I can, I, I'm giving you a sort of, reasons for prolonged uh, muscular blockade the the difficulty uh, just to give you on the on the other side the more you ventilate somebody and the longer you, you ventilate somebody you're 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 cheating mother nature so you're actually making weaning more difficult because the diaphragm ain't working so for 10 days 12 days uh, you just you just been positive pressure ventilating them, so the diaphragm just gets weaker and weaker. They've got malnutrition on board, like that case study. So, it, uh, so I, I would say to you, your 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 emergence, your induction, and your takeoff is good. Um, uh, if you're not landing, then uh, think about using a top up dose of your neuromuscular blockade, based on. The failure to respond to your fentanyl midazolam increases like a, a quick bolus because you think they may be in pain or getting waked up. And the second is look at your airway pressures and just make a decision and, and have no hesitation uh, if the airway pressures are going up or the patient's bucking or biting or showing ev evidence of, of irritation and agitation. Uh, get control. Thank you. I like that. Thanks. Anybody else? 
I think they've all been induced asleep. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, guys. It's been a, uh, I've enjoyed uh, today's session. It was not easy. I, I will send this the new slides out because I only added about fifteen slides just uh, in the last week because I, I got this paper from Emmanuel. It's it's on the um, it's on the um, chat uh, chat uh, chat show, so you can uh, the PDF is there. So have a look at it. It's really made it so clear and and good advice. So it's state state of the art. Thank you very much for today, Dr. DeMello. You're, uh, you're welcome, Michael. Good luck and uh, speak to Oh, um, I, I probably won't speak to you guys till next year. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and look forward to... Uh, I, I will still be listening to the lectures, but I won't be talking to you guys. But uh, all the best, and I hope you enjoyed it. And Emmanuel, thank you for that paper. It was brilliant. Thank you too, sir. It was a pleasure to share. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Brick. It's okay.